everyone. My name is Brianna Curl, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar on Flex PCB Design Guidelines for Manufacturing. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them in the questions panel as they come up. We will have representatives ready to answer your questions directly during the webinar. Today's webinar is hosted by EMA Design Automation and Sierra Circuit. EMA Design Automation is a leader in product development solutions offering a complete range of electrical and mechanical CAD tools, along with much more. Sierra Circus has 30 plus years of PCB manufacturing and assembly experience, which has made them the trusted source for end-to-end -end PCB prototypes. With that being said, I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and introduce you to our presenters, Amit Ball and Janine Flagg. Amit has been in the PCB industry for 20 years. He is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Sierra Circus. His passion is to empower tech companies to achieve their visions and change the world. Janine Flagg has worked with the Cadence Tools as an application engineer and as an end user for over 20 years. She specializes in the front to back flow and supports both the ORCAD and Allegro products. With that being said, I want to pass it on over to Mitt, and thank you. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, if there are any uh, problems with my audio, just chat with me so I can fix them. And we have a lot to talk about uh, in this uh, webinar, so let's get started. That's my pretty picture and Janine's pretty picture. So here's the table of contents. Why, why Flex anyways? What is the point of Flex? Why should we care about Flex? Well, I'll tell you. Flex is really growing, uh, and it has been growing for the last five to 10 years. So if you look at all the different types of PCB technologies, HDI, Flex, special materials, fine lines, uh, from our standpoint, Flex has been growing the most. And if you look at the IPC industry surveys, it's also growing a lot. So if you haven't, if you don't have uh, knowledge of Flex, then you could be missing out on some key advantages. So number one advantage is that you could have a possible cost reduction looking at a total systems cost. Of course, if you look at just the cost of a rigid flex PCB as an example, it will be more than its counterpart of a rigid PCB. But if you look at the total install cost, it will be less expensive. And it also adds uh, quality and reliability uh, to your end product. So in terms of uh, you know, how to use and the ease of use and the benefits. I think the key point is the reduction of failures in the PCB. So it's, you know, solder joint, every solder joint is a source of failure, as the saying goes, it's true. And so you want to make sure that, you know, in your connectors, let's say, you know, you could possibly eliminate some connectors and, um, you know, use rigid flex instead, and that would eliminate uh, potential failure points. And then, of course, when you're dealing with very intricate mechanical designs, a flex or a rigid flex really allows you to miniaturize um, the electronics and, you know, fit things into a tight space. So it's always about form, fit, and function when you talk about flex and rigid flex. I mentioned possible cost reduction. So just understand there's direct and indirect costs when you're looking at uh, flex. So my advice is don't have the supply chain people make the decisions on this technology, but as engineers, you should make the decisions on what technologies go into your product so you can have a better product. And then uh, for flex and rigid flex, there's always static and dynamic applications. Uh, so be aware of which uh, application uh, you are going to be um, you know, using and just be aware that even if it's a bend to install, uh, people will flex that board. You know, it flexes uh, in the PCB fabrication area, the assembly area, it will flex when it comes to you. The, your internal quality teams, they'll, they'll start flexing it. So there's never really a one-time flex. It's still always many um, flexes. Okay, so I think these are the key points um, in understanding, you know, saying that you have a good understanding of flex. You know, understanding, of course, how the board will bend, um, understanding a little bit about the materials, how you route, which Janine will go into later, all that's really important. 
I think bend radius is super important. Uh, so for a bend radius, you know, you basically it's a, the minimum amount of uh, bend basically that you can you can deal with. So you want to make sure that you understand how many copper layers you have in your flex region that would then have to bend. So that's a super important point to be able to calculate your bend radius. And IPC 2223 specifies the standards of, of the bend radius. So take a look at that. If you have a you know, multi-layer board, uh, flex board, uh, at least the flex section of the rigid flex board, you need to really consider the flex thickness times, you know, probably about, you know, 15 is your minimum bend radius. It says 24, but there's some leeway there. Now, really important is understanding and sharing the understanding with the fabricator on what are the flex regions and what are the rigid regions in a rigid flex application. So always have like a drawing that really specifies out, you know, all these details. So that way your manufacturer can give as much guidance as, as possible. So these are some general guidelines when designing a uh, flex and rigid flex. So you want to avoid your 90 degree bends. Uh, you know, you definitely want uh, to have higher uh, thresholds or, you know, your, in your design rules, you want everything to be as loose as possible because there's a lot of variation when you're doing a flex and rigid flex. Um, you definitely don't want plated holes in your flex area if you can avoid them. You also don't want components in your flex area if you can avoid them, because those all can lead to uh, failures at the solder joints. So in terms of knowing your flex materials, there's really adhesive based and adhesive lists. And so I'm a proponent of adhesive lists because I've seen many instances where adhesive, although sometimes necessary, can is a is a root cause for failure. And so there's Things you can do in this uh, type of a material like that prevents uh, more, it makes a more robust design, but it's still going to be an issue probably. So one example of thing, something you can do is not drill any less than a 10 mil via if you have adhesive materials in your stack up. I guess uh, it's always good to scare people. So you can have, you know, cracks both in copper and in laminate. So just know exactly what materials you're using and why. And so kind of these are the all of flex materials kind of fall into these categories. And we primarily use DuPont flex material. And I think most manufacturers in the United States use uh, DuPont. So the AP refers to uh, core and LF refers to, you know, bond flies and such. In terms of routing, uh, here's some examples of what's incorrect and correct. So you don't want any sharp angles. And then also, if you're looking from the top side to the bottom side of your flex, you don't want the copper tracks directly over each other. So moving on to stack up. Of course, since I'm a manufacturer and I've seen all the trials and tribulations um, of getting suboptimal designs and being told we need to get this manufactured can you do it? And you know the answer is we can do it, but it's going to be a suboptimal reliability quality. So it's always good to get your stack up ahead of time from your manufacturer. And you know think about your design from a standpoint of you know can I get rid of these connectors? How can how's my flex going to bend? Can I where do I put my components so they're not too close to any transition areas? You know think about everything and then. At the same time, you have to think about your stack up. So there's not too much to think about. So one thing is always place your flex layers, of course, in the middle of the stack up. And I know some industries do have flex on the outer layers. Um, it's really not recommended and it's harder to build. So the way a, a normal fabricator builds their product uh, in the US, I would say, is that the flex are on the inside. And when you're building your product, then that means that we're basically building a rigid board 
And when time comes at the end of the process, we're opening up some cavities that exposes the flex. And so the difficult part of that, the easy part of that is we're processing a rigid board most of the way through. And the difficult part of that is that if you don't get your uh, material tolerances correctly, you could have, uh, you know, spill over out onto the flex region, which would minimize your uh, bend radius. So as a manufacturer, we have to have really up-to-date materials, no expired materials, and really understand how the material is going to flow. Because there's really no such thing as no flow pre-preg and rigid flex. There's always a little bit of flow, and the manufacturer has to be aware of that, how they're going to handle that. So some quick examples um, of some stack ups. And I, I just want to point out that most of the time cover lay is used um, in flex and rigid flex. And when the density becomes very tight, let's say you have a tight pitch component, uh, we use flexible solder mask at that point, um, both for registration and just um, you know the the density or the tightness of the components uh, and the pitches of the components. You know, that being said, it's really important to work with a manufacturer that has the latest uh, equipment uh, to handle the misregistrations that have come along with flex. Uh, you know, flex are very thin. Uh, they can stretch and skew during manufacturing. Uh, you need to be able to, as a manufacturer, handle that. And what that means is that all the equipment needs to be vision-based equipment and all the equipment need to talk to each other. So those, I would say, are the bare requirements for uh, flex, manufacturing flex and reflex. Here's some other examples. There's the adhesive in there connected to an FR4 stiffener. Some more examples. I'm just going to breeze through these. So. You can have any of these types of structures. Um, just be careful that in your, in, when you do your stack ups, uh, you don't want your flex regions to have too much copper. So when it's, let's say excessive amounts of copper, it's gonna be harder to bend uh, and you, won't, you might not achieve your bend radius um, and you might end up with cracking in the copper if there's too much copper. As well as the, if you're doing a ground pour across the flex, you know, you want to, instead of a ground pour and a rigid board, you'd want to do a cross hatch. So it'd allow for flexibility as well. And from an etching standpoint, we like a 10 mil, you can do your cross hatch with like a 10 mil line. I just really wanted to highlight the point of not putting your flex layers on the outer layer. So this is something that a customer sent in and, you know, it's just basically very difficult to manufacture. So instead you want to do something like that. So in this case, I guess uh, there was like a high speed ZIF. Uh, and so they were really concerned about their impedance. You can still achieve uh, the impedance requirements. Talk to your manufacturer, they'll give you a stack up. And uh, you know, you don't need to put your flex on the outer layers for that. Let's talk about stiffeners for a second. So stiffeners are good. Uh, a lot of people think stiffeners will save you a ton of cost, and it really doesn't. Stiffeners, if not done properly, can increase your cost because of the labor required to do the stiffener. So just follow some basic guidelines um, for stiffeners. Uh, make sure you don't have uneven thicknesses of stiffeners. That would be the worst in terms of cost impact because it's more labor. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's some other guidelines on this slide. My advice is if you're using stiffeners and you can afford, let's say, a rigid flex. I would go that way. Uh, annular ring is important in every PCB design, and it's especially important in flex and rigid flex designs uh, because of the button plate that has to happen. So, on a regular board, when you uh, do your outer layer plate, you basically drill your vias and you plate the vias and the outer layer surfaces at the same time. And in uh, rigid flex or flex, that is not the case. You basically do a, a button plate where you're imaging and plating just a little bit outside of the via, the size of the via, so that you get your wrap and all that stuff. But you're not plating on the surface of the board because 
if you plate on the surface and you have those two different types of plating, that's where, you know, when the board bends or flexes, you can have your uh, cracking. So whenever you have two different, you know, types of copper or, you know, plating of copper on top of another copper, all those are areas for failures, both in rigid and rigid flex and flex. So that's how this has come about, that you only do button plating uh, for flexes. Uh, here's some guidelines, and Janine will talk more about uh, the guidelines for annular rings when she does a demo, practical demo. The only other thing I would say is that, uh, you know, if you have very tiny pads, um, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt to add those anchors or, you know, dog ears or whatever you want to call them. That could help a little bit in terms of adhesion. And, uh, you know, always do teardropping. And I guess it goes without saying that you want to make sure that annular rings are always as big as possible. Uh, don't do things like set one via structure and use it for the whole board and never go back and change things. Always go into the areas where you can open things up some more and spend the time to do that. Because remember, one quality defect or one bad via and your board uh, is no longer good. The whole board is bad. So keep that in mind when you're designing that spending that extra time to really loosen things up will be very helpful. So now I'm switching over to uh, Janine for the demo. So I'm Janine Flagg and I'll be doing the demo for you today. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start about, I'm gonna start by talking about the uh, stack up and different zones of the board. So when you have a rigid flex board, obviously you have different zones of the board and those different zones can have different stack ups. Okay, so we're gonna go into the cross section editor here and you'll see that I actually have, so the primary stack up actually pretty much has everything in it. Um, so we have, you know, basically all the layers defined that I'm gonna use in all stack ups here. And then I have a primary stack up. Then I have a flex one. So I have several different flex stack ups, okay? So they may have the same inner layers, but they may have different uh, cover layers and adhesives and stiffeners and so forth. And then I have one rigid. So to add a stack up, it's actually pretty easy. You just click on the plus button here. You can name your stack up. So I'm gonna name this one rigid two. Okay. And I can either say, I'd like to include all layers to begin with, in which case then you can just go in and remove the layers you don't need. Or you can say, I want to exclude all layers, so then I'll go in and add the ones I want. Or I can copy a particular stack up. Okay, I'm just gonna say exclude to begin with and click okay. Okay, so I can now see that I have a, I have rigid two. Okay, and if I click on rigid two here, you can see that I actually really don't have anything there yet. So I need to go in and um, I need to define or select the layers that are gonna be added to my rigid two. Oops. Let's go all stack ups and come over here to rigid two. And I wanna start out and add, I need to have a solder mask, okay? and a paste mask. And then I'm gonna basically just take all these layers. Okay, you have to add your dielectric layers. It won't allow you to add two um, conductor layers without having a, um, a dielectric in between. Okay, just a few more clicks. There's our bottom layer, there's our bottom paste mask and our bottom solder mask. Okay, so, and you can see over here on the right-hand side, we have you know, the different stack ups, okay, are kind of, you can see how they look. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So then, 
I'm going to click OK to accept that, to save that and stack up. And now I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a new zone. Okay, so I have different zones on this board. This one's zone two. I have zone five, four, three. Okay, so I'm going to create a new zone. And I don't have to be super careful about how I do this because it's going it's going to adhere to the board outline and it will not um, it won't overlap an existing zone. Okay, so I've created this zone one. So now when I created it, I could assign different things to it. I could make it a constraint region. I could assign the particular stack up that I want, or I can go into the zone manager and I can do all those things. So if we go down, this is the new one I just created. I wanted to add my rigid two stack up to it, um, which goes from the top layer to the bottom layer of the board. You can see that some of these other zones Okay, have uh, a certain flex stack up and they may go from you know flex one to flex two okay so the top layer there is the flex one layer it's not the actual top layer of the board I can also make a zone a constraint region and I can assign specific rules to that region and again I can make it a, a room for um, placement so I can specify certain components need to go into the rigid two room. So once I've done that, now this particular area knows exactly what layers are contained in that area. So all these layers do. And now if I go, let's go into placement application mode. And you can see that I have some components that are not placed yet. Now, if I take one of these components and I go and place it in a specific area, let's rotate that, you'll see that this one gets placed on the top layer, okay, which is green. If we look at the visibility here, top layer is green, so that's why the pads show up green. Now, depending on the area where I place it, this one flex or internal one is actually the top layer in this area in zone five and if i place it in this area right here this particular area is also internal one okay it really it understands what is the top layer of the board and it's able to place it on that top layer okay or if i had mirrored it of course you can place it on the whatever is considered the bottom layer in that zone Let's talk a little bit about routing for flex. So when you're routing for flex, you need to be able to route multiple nets together and you need to have them all nicely curved and so forth. So, um, so we use what we call contour routing. So if I go into my add connect mode, I'm gonna select all these guys and then I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna choose, I wanna go into contour mode. So now I'm going to contour it to the route keep in this line here. This line here is actually the board outline and this line is the route keep in. So I want to contour these along the route keep in. Okay, so you'll notice and I can zoom out here a little bit as I go around here. It actually will follow the exactly along the uh, route keep in. Of course, we don't want to go quite that that far. So once I get past the the curved areas then I could actually go ahead and finish this. So I can go to single trace mode and start routing these guys. All right, so next I'm gonna show you one more design. So we're gonna go back to kind of our original design. And this board, this is already, this area has already been routed, but now we have another trace that we need to get in. So ordinarily, you'd probably have to rip them all up and then route them again as a nice group. But here, because we still have contour routing, we can actually select this. Again, I'm still in contour routing. I, this time, I want to contour it to this trace, this adjacent trace. Okay. So I select the trace that I want to contour it to. And then you'll see that it will just start pushing and shoving. And it can even push and shove arcs. Okay. So we can easily just go through here and finish routing okay so 
And that makes it really, really easy to go ahead and fit in one more trace. And it could shove multiple traces if you need. And next, let's talk a little bit about um, special constraints. Okay, there's a lot of special constraints that you need to think about when you're doing rigid flex. And a lot of them, they're not necessarily just spacing on the same layers. You need to be able to create either spacing or overlapping rules or all kinds of different types of rules between different layers, electrical and non-electrical. So if we go in and look at some of these DRCs that we have here, so we're saying that the bend area and the stiffener need to have a gap of about 20 mils, okay? And if we place our cursor over the DRC error, you can see the DRCs are little bow ties. So if I place my cursor over that, it's telling me that the constraint value is 20 mil, but I only have really a 12 mil gap. So I could modify my shape there and fix that one, okay? Here, we have a bend area and a transition zone, okay? And we need an overlap here of 25 mils. And this is telling me, if I place again my cursor over my DRC error, that it is requiring 25 mils, but we only have an eight mil overlap. Here we need spacing between vias. Okay, so we have a via and a transition zone, and we need a gap of 12 mils, and we only have a gap of seven mils. So now yeah, we can fix it. I'm not gonna fix all of them, mainly because um, of time constraints. We only have so much time here, but um, you know, you could just slide your via down a little bit and the, v and the DRC goes away, okay? So we have another one over here where um, your gold soft flex and your cover, cover lay need to be in line, basically, or what we call, this is an inside rule. They're not perfectly registered, okay? So again, you could slide your, your uh, shapes. Okay, and here's one to checking to the edge of the board. This one is, um, yeah, it's requiring 45 mil and we only have 25. So again, you can slide those. Now I'm actually gonna go into the constraint manager and we're gonna create a rule here and it's gonna be an overlap rule, the transition area and the tin plating, okay? So we're gonna go into, cons into the constraint manager and here's the interlayer spacing rules. And this looks like a really confusing <laughs> matrix at first, but basically, I mean, you would really, so this right here, this constraint right here is a constraint between a bend area and a transition zone, okay? Which is this one right here. So to make it a little bit easier, I'm actually going to use some filtering. So I wanna create I want between the transition zone and tin plate bottom, okay? I wanna create a new constraint. So here's my transition zone, tin plate bottom. Right now it's undefined. I'm gonna say this is actually an overlap rule, okay? So I want an overlap of say 25 mils and I need to enable it. And I'm gonna pick a DRC label. So I want it to be a lowercase t. The DRC flag is gonna show up on interlayer, and I can put in a description. Prevent tin plate peeling. Okay, so that's my, that's my description. So now I can go back, and first of all, we need to, um, we need to make sure that our DRCs are up to date. Let's update my DRCs, and we have a new DRC here. So, and this is IT. So we know this is mine. So if I place my cursor over it, it's telling me that I'm requiring a 25 mil overlap and I only have a 10 mil overlap. So at this point, I could go ahead and slide my shape. I'm gonna get into shape application mode, set my behavior here, we're clicking on the side, and then I can go ahead and um, just slide this over. Okay, my DRC goes away. So there's, those are your interlayer rules. And of course you can create as many as you want. I only have just a few on this design, but I mean, you can create between pretty much any layer to another layer. So the interlayer rules do not check elements on the same layer, only elements between two layers. 
So I'm going to go back into the constraint manager now, and we're going to look a little bit at the manufacturing rules. So some of them that are really important, as I was saying, is the um, annular ring. Okay. Manufacturing rules, we can set a whole bunch of different annular ring type of constraints. So first we want to set some for the actual electrical layer. So we want to make sure that um, we have specific annular ring. So here we say hold to pad. Okay, so we're asking for a six mil spacing. So this is six mils each side. So really we're saying that the, um, the pad is going to be 12 mils larger than the hole. And this one, the hole to the anti-pad, we want at least 10 mils. The, um, or it's 10 mils each side, so it's really 20 mils, right? And on vias, so that's for through hole pins, okay? This is for vias. So we want five on each side and um, 10 mils on each side for the anti-pad, okay? And we've actually created different rules for our flex versus our rigid, okay? So flex is four and 10. And we didn't specify any rules for through-hole pins in the flex area because we don't put through-hole pins in flex areas, okay? So we just have, you know, via rules there. And then we also have mask rules. So uh, for the solder mask, I just want to make sure that we don't have any solder masks that are missing on our pins. So we didn't set any of that up for the vias because um, our vias are not don't have solder mask clearance. And then paste mask also, we wanted to check and make sure that there is um, you know, no paste mask missing on uh, on pins on surface metal pins. And then of course we want for our solder mask, we're asking for two ovaries. All right, so, and then we're going to actually assign them to the different layers. So we have to, we have our different stack ups here and we can assign those specific rules, okay? So all of our flex layers or stack ups really get the conductor layers there, get the flex rules. And then any of our rigid areas get rigid rules, okay? And we can also set our mask rules here. So that's the constraints. And, oh, I forgot. There's also, you can do um, pretty elaborate um, fab drawings if you want with this, with these tools. So I've kind of got, it's not complete. I don't have fab notes and all that, uh, but I do have my, um, I created drill information. So it automatically creates drill information for each um, set of layer pairs. Okay, so we have one that goes from all the way from the top to the bottom. Okay, this one goes from inner layer one to inner layer four. And then we have all of our different stack ups defined here. So here's the cross section of each stack up. Here's our rigid one. Here's the primary. Okay, here's flex one, flex two, there's flex three, and flex four. Okay, so you can define the stack ups and then get your, um, get the cross-section drawing created for you automatically. And you can decide what kind of information you want there as well. Okay, next, let's go to, it's a rigid flex design. And I'm gonna bring it in and look at it in a 3D mode. So before I do that, let's go in and look at, um, we've defined some bend areas here. Okay, so this is one bend area. So you can define the actual bend line, and you also want to define the um, the inner radius of the bend, and of course you can also define your via keepouts and package keepouts and so forth. Because obviously you don't want any vias and uh, components and stuff placed too close to the bend area. Next, I'm going to take this into my 3D viewer, or I should say the 3D canvas. It's really more than a viewer. Okay, it takes a moment to render. So here's my design. So I can move it around, look at it from different sides. Now I'm gonna go ahead and bend it. So I can bend it, I could bend each section separately. So we've bent some of it, or I can just go in and bend the entire thing. We can move it around and look at it while it's bent. And then I'm gonna go ahead and check collisions. I wanted to calculate 
and uh, make sure that I don't have components that are too close together. Now I'm actually setting my minimum spacing at zero. So it's only going to select or it's only going to flag components that are actually touching each other. And we have, it looks like U24 and U5, now that it's bent, is they're touching each other, okay? And you can see the radius here is actually kind of small. It should be a little bigger like this. So I could go in and modify the radius and um, correct that issue. But this lets you know right away before you ever get to, you know, trying to fabricate the design that you need to fix that, um, that issue right there. So, and I actually have a design where we've corrected that. So let's take this again into the 3D viewer. And I'm gonna go ahead and bend it. And we can see already that we don't have the problem, but you know, just to put our minds at ease, we can go ahead and calculate and it won't find any components with an issue. Okay. And I just have one more design to show you in the 3D canvas. So I have this design, and this design is interesting because it has some really strange bends in it. Let's go into the 3D viewer real quickly. Yeah, so this one is actually pretty interesting. It's got, um, if you look at the different bend areas, you can see the bend lines sticking out, and they really have some, some interesting angles here. Oh, there it is. It went into the back. Okay, so here we go. Let's go into the bends and let's do the first one here. And you can see that's kind of a, an unusual bend. And this one here, it's going to bend it back. So you can see that these are really strange angled bends. This one over here. Yeah, see this bends. This is a pretty 90 degree bend here but the next one is a is kind of a strange angle yeah so this is basically all i had to show i'm going to turn it back over to brianna thank you janine and i will pass this back over to amit thank you very much for passing it back to me uh the only other topic before q a is that um you need to really think about your fabrication drawing and have the appropriate fabrication notes um, you know flex boards are fundamentally different from rigid boards you can't take a rigid design and ask us to manufacture it with flex materials uh, and somehow magically that think that would work it, it doesn't um, we need uh, a flex design for flex materials and uh, you really shouldn't uh, mix that uh, I've seen people design a rigid board and then later turn it into a flex design uh, because rigid boards are, let's say, faster and cheaper to make in prototype, but it uh, really introduces a lot of variation that uh, will, could catch you later on down the road. So flex uh, fab notes are critical. I'm going to briefly touch on that. You know, this is a summary, like, it, you know, think about uh, what to put on your fabrication note. I mentioned earlier, you definitely want a very clear either Gerber layer or fabrication drawing that tells you tells us the different sections of your board, rigid versus flex. And you know, one example, we were looking at these weird bending patterns, and you can do that. You'd want to probably put slots in your flex area so it can achieve the bend a little easier. And the, you know, you need to have that slot called out on a fab drawing or in your Gerber layer. So those are the types of things that go in the drawing. Knowing the materials and, you know, basically putting the manufacturer's stack up on your drawing, I think is the best thing. So it's not confusing uh, as to what you're actually looking for in terms of material. And then uh, of course the whole chart drill, no, some of the things are very normal along with rigid uh, fab drawings. So these are some of the IPC uh, guidelines you should definitely put on the drawing. And a few more things. Uh, most fabricators have vacuum presses at this stage, so I don't think you need that particular note, but I think it's really good always to put a registration requirement, um, detail out your impedance requirements. Uh, all those are uh, very good things. 
I would always ask for a cross section for your rigid flex and flex boards, even though it's not required, because that will tell you so much about the inside of your board. And you know, rigid flex and flex do have. <clears throat> if you're not working with a, uh, the right manufacturer, there there could be different issues. Um, so always get that kind of a cross section. So I put that on your fab drawing. So that's kind of a summary of the fab drawings. Um, if you reach out to us after, or if you'd like, we can give a sample fabrication drawing, um, you know, that you could use and, and look at as well. Yeah, so at this time, we can move into the Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can uh, ask them in the questions panel, and we'll try to get to you. Um, we do have lots of questions, so we can get started here. Um, can you elaborate on the advantages or disadvantages of using flux with and without adhesive layers? Rupa, can you, are you online? Can you answer that one? Yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Amit. Yes. Um, so if you, see, adhesive is used only in case of the multi-layer flex. If you are using the double-sided and the single-sided, we know we don't need to use the with adhesive data because uh, when you use a with adhesive material, it will have some impact on the product. If you are using that product in some moisture or uh, where you it is exposed to the moisture, then it is not advisable to use with adhesive material. So when it goes to the multi-layer flex, uh, adhesive is used to bond them uh, because we have to bond two cores uh, in order to get the multi-layer. Only in that case, we want to use it. So otherwise, we 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 would like to use the bond plane, not the pure adhesive. Thank you. So our next question is: What's the difference between coverlay and solder mask? Okay, coverlay is the material, uh, which is a combination of adhesive and the capton, or you can call it as the polyimide. So coverlay will have a two section: one will the thin layer of adhesive, and top of that thin layer of capton or polyimide. The solder mask is the liquid. So the the when it comes to the coverlay, we have to lam it using the lamination process. Coverlay is a screen print. Sorry, solder mask is a screen printing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have someone else asking, what is button plating? Button plating? Yeah. Button plating is nothing but the, you will plate only in the holes, not on the surface. In a conventional rig board, we plate uh, copper on the surface along with the in the plating in the hole. But on the, for the flex pure flex board, we do button plating. It means we plate only in the hole. It means we, there won't be any extra copper plating on the surface. Okay, thank you. Our next question is: I have heard that these are not recommended on bending areas. Is it true? And what is the impact? Yes, it is true. Because if you have a VS uh, in a bending area, when you try to bend the board, it will create a stress inside the VR hole and it will break the whole weight plating. So it is not yeah. at all recommended to have any VRs on the flex uh, bendable area. Okay. It's also recommended not to have 90 degree bends there too, because in the bending of the flex, it can cut through. Yes, that is true. Any sharp edges is not uh, advisable to put there. You always have some radius. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, since you don't recommend heavy copper on the flex region, what other approaches outside of cross-hatch shape would you recommend for a multi-layer flex region that has large amounts of copper for high current requirements? Uh, yes. Because the maximum copper recommended on the flex is a two ohms, because it will reduce the flexibility of the uh, flex section. So you you can when you have a too much requirement of a current, it is advisable to use multi layers instead of only one or two layers. Um, can orchid be used for flex design, or is it just a leg row? Orchid PCB designer professional handles. Um, flex design. It basically does everything that I showed today. Um, one thing I didn't show today was the crosshatch shapes. We can easily do dynamic crosshatch shapes uh, for the flex designs as well. So yes, 
or CAD PCB designer professional, the standard does not have everything that you need, but the professional one does. Thank you, Janine. Mm -hmm. Your next question is, what is usual whole plating thickness for vias for flex boards? Point eight me. Okay, thank you. Is it possible to have a microstrip line for high frequency signal and flex? Yes. Our next question is, do you have any tips for depaneling flex design? Yeah, so usually we uh, we, want, we would like to do uh, the flex and rigid flex as an individual board. And uh, if they want, if customer insists us to do in array, we do them in array and depanelize them after assembly. Okay, thank you. The mm -hmm. next question is, which is the typical copper weight for the flux layers and what would be the maximum? So minimum, uh, the standard minimum we can use is a 0.5 ounce and maximum is a two ounce. And we can go down to 12 micron if it is required. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question I think is more directed towards Orlin or Janine. Is it possible to set parameters for pushing clearance of other traces when routing without changing the DRC rules? When you set those up, you can set them up individual for, for those nets, but those rules now become the new DRCs for those particular nets. It'd be same as if you were routing differential pairs. Differential pairs have a different spacing requirement, but you set those rules and that becomes a DRC for those particular nets. Okay, thank you. Let's see, our next question is, what is the minimum distance of copper or trace to board edge? So if we are talking about the pure flex, we can go down yeah. to three mil from the copper edge to the board edge. Okay, thank you. What is the best way to connect the flex to rigid part? So if it, yeah, if it is a separate rigid board and the flex board and you want to connect them using the zip connector, if you are building the rigid flex, then usually the flex will be in the center of the stack up of the rigid section and we build first the flex section and we land them together with the rigid material. Yeah, one additional thing, you can also do like hot bar uh, soldering if that's what you want to do. So our next question is, why are teardrops recommended? As we know that flex material is very flimsy, so there are chances of cop, uh, copper side lifting from the material to avoid and put it uh, to uh, hold it properly that teardrops is required. So it will give the most strength, strength to the pad. When the drill wander happens as well, it's always nice in a rigid board to have some teardropping. So you have more, you're a lot, you know, you have more space for the drill to wander. Not that we would wander our drills, but it's possible. There was a question on the difference yeah. between bikini constructions versus having the flex go across the full rigid section of the board as well. Can you talk mm -hmm. about the advantages and disadvantages of that? Okay, so the, the bond play going inside the rigid section, right? Yes. Yeah, so when we are uh, we are building a board, rigid flex board with a multi-layer flex, so usually we add the bonding material only in the flex section and add the prepreg on the rigid section. So creating the full, uh, we usually avoid using the full sheet of bond play in order to get the better bonding and delamination, uh, to avoid the delamination in the rigid section. So that's why we prefer uh, bikini, we call it as a bikini, half uh, pre-preg and the half bond play. We have another question here. Um, can you achieve class three fabrication with flex boards? Yes. Okay. And then can copper slash cover lay be used for marking as well? Uh, cover, we cannot add any markings on the cover lay because it's a laminate, it's a material. So markings can be added on the uh, copper or on the silk screen. Let's see if there's any other questions here. Feel free, Amit, to chime in if you see any that stick out to you. They want to know um, 
if the board files presented today, if they could get those files. Those are Cadence files and they allow those to be sent out to customers. So yes, then. Okay, great. Um, there's a question, um, which I don't know the answer to, Rupa, maybe you do. Is there a difference in how to design the coverlay when using traditional coverlay versus using the new photo imageable coverlay material? So we, we, you mean to say the flexible shoulder mask along with the coverlay? Yeah, I think that's what the question is, yes. Yeah. So when when we are using the coverlay, we, uh, you cannot use a coverlay on a tight pitch component. For example, if you have a BGA, you cannot have a coverlay there because you cannot maintain the um, web between the pads. So usually what we do is we do selective flexible LPR and the rest will be done with the coverlay because coverlay, most of the time coverlay openings are the gang mask opening or you can say call it as a window opening, but the same cannot be applied on the tight pitch component. So we, we can use the combination of both coverlay and the flexible shoulder mask. I think uh, yeah. those are some. I think those are some good questions, um, and I think uh, we can answer the rest via email. Yeah, we've gone over a little of our time here. So for those that we weren't able to respond to during the live Q and A, we can always follow up with you independently, and um, we'll get in touch with you that way. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and thank you, Amit and Janine, and for all our help on the back end too. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Yeah, thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.